A story of beginning. The people who lived long ago, in the far off lands of the north, watched the wonderful things that happen out of doors every day, just as we do. But they did not know about the one loving God, who is the Father of all, who made them and the world, and rules it by His wise laws. So, they thought there must be a great many unseen powers, living in the clouds, in the wind, in the storms, and in the sunshine, doing all those wonders that no man could do. And so, those northern people, who were our own forefathers, came to believe in many gods: one for the sun, another for the thunder. Another for the flowers, and so on. In the long, dark winters, when the bright sun had gone away from them, these Northmen had time to think many thoughts about the powers of frost, and wind, and storms, which they called giants. And they used to tell stories, and sing songs about the short, bright summer. The thawing out of the streams and lakes, the coming of the birds and flowers. With great joy, the people saw the bright sun god Baldur come back to them in the spring, after a long darkness, and knew that they owed their lives to his friendly warmth and light. As one reads the stories or myths told by those people long ago. We can see that they were meant to tell about the world around us. At first, the stories were told and sung from father to son, that is, from one generation to another. But later, when people learned how to write, these myths were written down and kept with great love and care. This is the story they told of the beginning. At first. Before living creatures were in the world, it was all rough and without order. Far to the north, it was very cold. Fires and snow were everywhere. Toward the south, there was fire, and from the meeting of fire and the cold, a thick vapor was formed, from which sprang a huge giant, unlocking about for some food. He saw a cow, who was also searching for something to eat. The ice tasted salt, and when the cow began to lick it, a head appeared, and at last the whole figure of a god stood before her. From these two, the giant and the god, came the two great races of giants and gods, who were always enemies to each other. The giants were constantly trying to break into Asgard. The home of the gods in the sky. The gods, on the other hand, watched and planned to keep out the giants and to drive them back into their own stronghold, Utgard. Our world, where men and women lived, was between Utgard and Asgard. It was called Midgard, and around this Midgard world, under the ocean. Was coiled a monstrous serpent, who grew so long that his tail grew down his throat. He was called the Midgard Serpent. A wonderful tree named Yggdrasil connected the worlds. This great ash tree had its roots in Utgard, and the tops of its branches reached up so high as to overshadow Asgard. Its three main rooms were watered by three fountains, and near one of them sat the wise giant Mimir, of whom we shall hear later. The Norns, three sisters, also lived at the roots of Yggdrasil, and were careful to see that it was watered every day. A little grey squirrel was always running up and down the tree. Jerking his tail and hurrying to tell the news to everyone along the way, 
He was so anxious to be the first one to carry the news that many times he brought trouble to himself and to others. Because he was not always careful to tell a story just as he had heard it, and often every one would have been happier if the squirrel had kept the story quiet to himself. The gods and goddesses all together were called Aesir, and the chief and father of them all was Odin. His lofty throne rose high in the midst of Asgard, the sacred city which the gods had built for their beautiful home. From Asgard, arching over and down to the lower world, was a rainbow bridge called Bifrost, the trembling bridge. Upon this, the dwellers in Asgard could travel every day, or, except the mighty Thor, his thunder chariot was too heavy for the trembling bridge. So, he had to go around a longer way. After the gods had made men and women, and had taught them to dwell on the earth, in the world of Midgard, Odin looked forth one morning from his heavenly seat to see what further work was waiting for his helping hands. He noticed far away below him a race of small beings, some of them busy doing mischievous deeds, while others sat idle, doing nothing. Odin sent for all these little people to come to him, and when they had reached Asgard, and were admitted to his palace of Gladsheim, they entered the great judgment hall, where they found all the Aesir sitting, with Father Odin at their head. The little people waited in a crowd near the door, wondering what was going to happen to them, while Hermod, the messenger of the gods, ran to his master to say that they had come. Then, the Alfather spoke to the little dwarfs about their evil deeds among men, and he told the naughtiest ones that they must go and live down underground and look after the great furnace fire in the middle of the earth, to keep it always burning. Some must get coal to feed the fire, and others still were to have charge of the gold and silver and precious stones under the rocks. Not one of these busy dwarves must ever appear during the day. Only by night might they venture to leave their task. And now, said Odin, turning to the idle ones, what have you been doing? We were doing nothing at all, though we could not have harmed anyone. And we pray you to spare us, cried they. Do you not know that those who sit idle, when they should be doing good, deserve punishment too, said Odin. I shall put you in charge of all the trees and flowers, and shall send one of the Aesir to teach you, so that you may doing some good in the world. Then the little elves went to work among the flowers, and Frey, the bright god of summer and sunshine, was a kind master to them. He taught them how to open the folded boats in the sunshine, to fill the honey cups and lead the bees along the flower passages to find their food to hatch their birds' eggs, and teach the little ones their songs, and then each night to fetch their water for dew drops to be hung on every leaf and blade of grass. When their work was finished, and the moon had risen, and these busy elves and fairies enjoyed many a happy evening, dancing and frisking on the green and by moonlight, and so... Our world of Midgard was filled with busy work and play. Even now, in our time, the people in the lands of the north and in Germany have many old sayings and stories that have come down to them from the days long ago. There is a beautiful white flower in the north, which is called Baldur's Pro, because it is so pure and bright, like the face of the dear sun god Baldur. And in some places, when the farmers gather, 
in their harvest of grain. They leave a little bunch of it standing in the fields for Father Odin's horse. We have some English names to remind of those old tales of our forefathers. But we have Tuesday, named for Tua or Tiu, a brave god who gave his right hand to save his friends. Wednesday or Wednesday, named for Odin. Thursday or Thor. The thunder gods, and Friday, but you know the god is Frigga or Freya, or for Frey, the god of summer, who ruled the fairies. Odin's rewards. One night, when all was quiet in Asgard and the Aesir had gone to rest, Odin, the old father, sat awake on his high throne, troubled with many thoughts. At his feet crouched his two faithful wolves, and upon his shoulders perched the two ravens of thought and memory, who flew far abroad every day through the nine worlds as Odin's messengers. The old father had need of great wisdom in ruling the worlds. After thinking a long time on the matters which needed his care, he suddenly started up. And went forth with long strides from his palace of Gladsheim into the night. He soon returned, leading his beautiful eight-footed steed Sleipnir, and it was plain that Odin was going on a journey. He quickly mounted Sleipnir and rode swiftly away towards Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge, which reached from Asgard, the city of the gods, down to the air. To the lower worlds, when Sleipnir stepped upon the bridge, he trembled, and seemed hardly strong enough to bear the horse and his rider. But he had no fear of its giving way, and Sleipnir galloped swiftly onwards. Soon, Odin saw Heimdall, the watchman of the bridge, riding toward him on a fine horse with golden mane that reflected light upon the noble face of his rider. You must be bound on some important errand, Father Odin. You are riding forth from Asgard so late at night," said Heimdall. "It is indeed a most important errand, and I must hasten on," replied Odin. "It is well for us that we have such faithful guardian of the trembling bridge. If it were not for you, Heimdall, our enemies might long ago have taken Asgard by storm. You are so watchful." You can hear the grass grow in the fields, and the wool gather on the back of sheep. And you need less sleep than a bird. I myself stand in great need of wisdom, in order to take care of such faithful servants, and to drive back such wicked enemies. They hurried over the bridge until they came to Heimdall's far shining castle. At the farther end of it, this. Was a lofty tower which was placed so as to guard the bridge, and it sent forth into the land of the giant enemies such a wonderful clear light that Heimdall could see, even on darkest night, anyone who came toward the bridge. Here, Odin stopped a few moments to drink the meat which the good Heimdall offered him. Then said Odin. As I am journeying into the land of our enemies, I shall leave my good horse with you. There are no many with whom I would trust him, but I know that you, my faithful Imdar, will take good care of him. I can best hide myself from the giants by going on as a wanderer. With these words, the old father quitted Imdar's castle. And started off toward the north, to the land of the fierce giants. During all the first day, there was nothing to be seen but ice and snow. Several times, Odin was nearly crushed as the frost giants hurled huge blocks of ice at him. The second day, he came to mountains and broad rivers. Often, when he had just crossed over a stream. 
the mountain giants would come after him to the other bank, and when they found that Odin had escaped them, they would send forth such a fierce yell that the echoes sounded from hill to hill. At the end of the third day, Odin came to a land where trees were green and flowers blooming. Here was one of the three fountains which watered the world tree Yggdrasil, a nearby sat the ice giant, Mimir, guarding the waters of this wonderful fountain. For whoever drank of it would have the gift of great wisdom. Mimir was a giant in size, but he was not one of the fierce giant enemies of the gods. For he was kind, and wiser than the wisest. Mimir's well of wisdom was in the midst of a wonderful valley filled with rare plants and bright flowers, and among the groves of beautiful trees were strange creatures, sleeping dragons, harmless serpents and lizards, while birds with gay plumage flew and sang among the branches. Over all this quiet valley shone a lovely soft light, Different from sunlight in the center grew one of the rules of the great world tree. Here, the wise giant Mimir sat gazing down into his well. Odin greeted a kind old giant and said, O oh, Mimir, I have come from far away, Asgard, to ask a great boon. Gladly will I help you, if it is in my power, said Mimir. You know, replied Odin, that as father of gods and men, I need great wisdom, and I have come to beg for one drink of your precious water of knowledge. Trouble threatens us, even from one of the Aesir, for Loki, the fire god, has lately been visiting the giants, and I fear he has been learning evil ways from them. The frost giants, the storm giants, are always at work, trying to overflow both gods and men. Great is my need of wisdom, even though no one ever before has dared ask so great a gift. I hope that since you know how deep is my trouble, you will grant my requests. Mimir sat silently, thinking for several moments, and then said, it was a great thing indeed, Father Odin. Are you ready to pay the price which I must demand? Yes, said Odin. I will give you all the gold and silver of Asgard, and all the jewels, shields, and swords of Isaiah. More than all, I will give up my eight-footed horse, Leibnir, if that is needed to win the rewards. And do you suppose that these things will buy wisdom? said Mimir. That can be gained only by bearing bravely and giving up to others. Are you willing to give me a part of yourself? Will you give up one of your own eyes? At this, Odin looked very sad. But after a few moments of deep thought, he looked up with a bright smile answered, Yes, I will even give you one of my eyes, and I will suffer whatever else is asked, in order to gain the wisdom that I need. We cannot know all that Odin bravely suffered in that strange blind valley, for he was rewarded with a drink from that wonderful fountain. But we may be quite sure it never once was the good old father sorry for anything he had given up, or any suffering he had borne for the sake of others. Tür and the Wolf Odin, the old father, sat one day on his high air throne and looking around him. Far and wide saw three fierce monsters they were the children of the mischievous fire god Loki, and Odin began to feel anxious, for they had grown so fast 
and were getting so strong that he feared they might do harm to the sacred city of Asgard. The wise father knew, though he had given strength to these dreadful creatures, and he saw that all this danger had come upon Yaisir from Loki's wickedness. One of these monsters was a huge serpent that Odin sent down into the ocean, where he grew so fast that his body was coiled around the whole world, and his tail grew into his own mouth. He was called the Midgard Serpent. The second monster was sent to Niflheim, the home of darkness, and shut up there. The third, a fierce wolf named Fenrir, was brought to Asgard, where Odin hoped he might be tamed by living among the Aesir and seeing their good deeds and hearing their kind words. But he grew more and more fierce, until only one of all the gods dared to feed him. This was the brave god, too. He was a war god like Thor, and is sometimes called the Sword God. Thor was loved by all because he was so true and faithful. Each day, the dreadful wolf grew larger and stronger, till all at once, before the Aesir thought about it, he had become a very dangerous beast. Father Odin always looked troubled when he saw Fenrir the wolf come to get his evening meal of meat from Thur's hand. And at last, one night, after the wolf had gone crawling away to his lair, Odin called a meeting of the Aesir. He told him of his fears, saying they must find some plan for guarding themselves and their home against this monster. They could not slay him, for no one must ever be killed, and no blood must be shed within the walls of the sacred city. Thor was the first to speak. Do not fear, Father Odin, for by tomorrow night we shall have Fenrir so safely bound that he cannot do us any harm. I will make a mighty chain with the help of my hammer Mjolnir, and with it we will bind him fast. When the Aesir heard these words of Thor, they were glad, and all went home rejoicing. All, save the old father, who was still troubled, for he well knew the danger, and feared that even the mighty Thor would find this task too much for him. But Thor seized his hammer and strode off to his forge. There, he worked all night long, and all through Asgard, I heard the blows of Mjolnir and the roaring of the blows. The next night, when the Aesir were gathered together, Thor brought forth his new main chain to test it. In came Fenrir the wolf, and everyone was surprised to see how willingly he let himself be bound with the chain. When Thor had with it the last links together, and the god smiled and began to praise him for his wonderful work. But all at once, the wolf gave one bound forward, broke the great chain and walked off to his lair, as if nothing had happened. Thor was much disappointed. Still, he did not lose courage. He said to the Aesir that he would make another chain, yet stronger. Again, he set to work. And for three nights and three days, the great Thor worked at his forge without resting. While he worked, his friends did not forget him. They came and looked on when he was busy, and as they watched, the mighty hammer falling with quick blows upon the metal, they talked to Thor or sung noble songs to cheer him. Sometime, they brought him food and drink. One visitor, was no friend. Fierce Fenrir, the wolf, sometimes put his nose in at the door for a moment and watched Thor at work. Then, as he went away, 
Thor heard a strange sound, like a wicked laugh. At last the chain was finished, and Thor tracked it to the place of meeting. It was so heavy that even the mighty Thor could hardly lift it or drag it as far as Odin's palace of Gladsheim. This time, Fenrir was not so willing to be bound, but the gods coaxed him and talked of his great strength, and told him they were sure he would easily break this chain also. After a while, he agreed to let them put it around his neck. This time, Thor was sure the chain would hold firm, for never before had such a strong one been made. But soon, with a great shake and a fierce bounce, the wolf broke away and went off to his lair, snarling and showing his thick teeth. But the broken chain lay on the ground. Sadly, the eyes here came together that night in Odin's palace, and this time Thor was not the first to speak. He sat apart and was silent. First spoke Frey, the god of summer and king of fairies. Hearken to me, O lords of Asgard, he said. I have not won a brave name in battle like the noble Tyr. Neither have I done such mighty deeds as the great Thor and the others of our heroes. Instead of fighting giants and monsters, I have spent most of my life in the woods among the flowers, listening for hours to the birds. Many things have I watched. Some perhaps that my brothers thought too small to be worthy of notice. I have learned many lessons. And the greatest of them always to know how much power there is in little things, and to see how often they work, done quietly, and hidden from the eyes of men, is the finest and the most wonderful. Since we cannot make a chain strong enough to bind Fenrir, let us go to the little dwarfs, work in silence and in darkness, and ask them. To make us a chain, the old father's troubled face grew brighter as he heard Frey speak, and he bade him send a messenger quickly to the dwarfs to order a chain made as soon as possible. So Frey went out, leaving the Aesir in the trouble, and came to his own lovely home, Alfheim, and there. Everything was bright and peaceful, and the little elves were busy and happy. Frey found the trusty messenger, and sent him with all speed to the dwarves' undergrounds, to order the new chain, and to return as soon as he could bring it. The faithful servant found the funny little dwarf workman all busy in the dark rock chambers. Far down inside the earth, while at one side, in a lighter place, sat the king. The messenger bowed before him, and told him his errands. The trolls were a wicked race, but they were afraid of Odin, for they had not forgotten the talk he once had with them, when he sent them down to work in the darkness undergrounds. And since that time, they never dared disobey him. The dwarf king said it would take two days and two nights to make the chain, but it would be so strong that no one could break it. While the busy dwarfs were at work, the messenger looked about at many wonderful things. The great central fire. Which burns always in the middle of the earth, watched and fed with coal by the dwarves. Above it, the beds of coal and bright precious diamonds, which the dwarves took from the ashes of the fire. In another place, he watched them putting gold and silver, tin and copper, into the cracks in the rocks, and he drank of the pure underground water. Which gives the Midgard people 
fresh springs. After two days, this messenger returned to the dwarf king, the king holding out in his hand a fine small chain. Said to the messenger, "This seemed to you to be small and weak, but it is a most wonderful piece of work. For we have used it in all the strongest stuff we could find. It is made of six kinds of things: the noise made by the footfall of cats, the roots of stones, the beards of women." The voice of fishes, the spittle of birds, the sinews of bears. This chain can never be broken, and if he can once put it on Fenrir, he will never be able to throw it off. Odin's messengers was glad to hear this, so he thanked the dwarf and promising him a large reward. He went on his way back to Asgard, where the Aesir were longing for his return, and were all rejoiced to see him with the magic chain. Now, Arda Odin feared that Fenrir would not let them bind him a third time, so he proposed they should all take a holiday and go out to a beautiful lake to the north of Asgard. Where they would have games and trials of strength, the other gods were pleased with his plan, and all set out in Frey's wonderful ship, which was large enough to hold all the Aesir, the horses, and yet could be folded up small enough to go in one's pockets. And they landed on a lovely island in the lake, and after the races and games were over. Frey brought out the little chain. He asked them all to try to break it. Thor and two had tried in vain. Then Thor said, "I do not believe anyone but Fenrir can break it." Now the wolf did not want to be bound again, but he was very proud of his strength, and for fear of being called a coward, was at last he would let them do it if. He might hold the right hand of one of the Aesir in his mouth while they high bound them, as a sign that the gods did not mean to play any tricks. When the gods heard this, they looked at each other, and all but one of them drew back. Only the brave Gudur, stepping forward quietly, put his hand into Fenrir's mouth. The other gods then put the chain around the beast and fastened it to a great rock. The fierce creature gave a leap to free himself, but the more he struggled, the tighter grew the chain. The Aesir gathered about him in joy to see this, but their hearts were filled with sorrow when they saw that their noble Thor had lost his right hand. The dreadful wolf had shut his teeth to get enraged, and he found he could not get free. Thus, the brave to dare to risk danger for the sake of saving others, and gave up even his right hand to gain peace and happiness for Asgard. Vaya's necklace. Yes, I really must have some flowers to wear to the fest tonight. Said Freya to her husband Odur. Freya was the goddess of love and beauty. She was the most beautiful of all the Aesir, and every one loved to look at her charming face and to hear her sweet voice. I think you look quite beautiful enough as you are without flowers, Odur replied. But Freya was not satisfied. She thought she would go and find her brother Frey, the god of summer, for he would give her a garland of flowers. So she wandered forth from Asgard, on her way to Frey's bright home in Alfheim, where he lived among his happy, busy little elves. As Frey walked along, she was thinking of the feast to be given that night in Asgard, 
and knowing that all the gods and goddesses would be there, she wished to look her very best. On and on she wandered, not thinking how far she was getting away from home. Finally, the light began to grow fainter and fainter, and Freya found herself in a strange place. The sunlight had faded away, but it was still a little light. It came from lanterns carried by funny little dwarfs who were busily working. Some were digging gold and gems, others were cleaning off the dirt from the precious stones and polishing them to make them bright, while four little fellows were seated in one corner, putting the sparkling stones together into a wonderful necklace. What? Can a beautiful thing be? thought Freya. If only I had that, it would surely make me look more beautiful than anyone else at the feast tonight. And the more she thought about it, the more she longed to get it. I really must have it, she said to herself. And with these words, she stepped nearer to the four little men. For what price will you sell me your necklace? She asked. The dwarves looked up from the work, and when they saw Freya's lovely face and heard her sweet voice, said, If you will only look kindly upon us and be our friend, you may have the necklace. And then, a mocking laugh echoed again and again through the dark heaven, seeming to say, How foolish you are to wish for these bright diamonds. They will not make you happy. But Freya snatched the necklace and ran out of the cavern. It did not please her to hear the teasing laugh of the dwarves, and she wanted to get away from them as soon as possible. At last, she was once more out in the open air. She tried to be free and happy again, but a strange feeling of threat came over her, as if something were going to happen. Soon, she came to a still pool of water, and, putting on the necklace, she went over to look at her picture in the clear water. How beautiful the diamonds were! and all they sparkle in the sunshine. She must hasten home to show them to Odor. The fair goddess soon reached Nasgard, and hurried to the palace to find her husband. But Odor was not there. Over and over again she searched through all the rooms in vain. He had gone, and although Freya had a beautiful necklace, she had little for it now to the husbands. Soon, it was time to go to the feast, but Freya would not go without Odur. She sat down and wept bitter tears. She felt no joy, now, for having the necklace, and no sorrow, because she could not feast with the Isaiah. If only Odur would come back, all would be well again. I will go to the end of the world to find him, said Freya she began to make ready for her journey. A chariot drawn by two cats was soon ready. Before she could start, she must first ask Father Odin to allow her to go. Al Father, I beg you, give me leave to go to look for my order in every corner of the world. The wise father replied, Go, fair Freya, and may you find whom you seek. Then, she started forth. First to the Midgard world, the goddess of beauty went, but no one in all of the world had seen or heard of Hordua. Down under the earth, to Niflheim, and even to Utgard, the land of giants, she wandered, but still, no one had seen or even heard of her husband. Poor Freya wiped many tears, 
and wherever the teardrops fell and sank into the ground, they turned into glistening gold. At last, the sad goddess returned to her own palace alone. She still wore the wonderful necklace, which was called Prisi Garmin. One night, when the hour was late, all the Aesir were asleep, except the ever watchful Heimdall, who heard soft footsteps like those of a cat near Freya's palace. He listened and thought, that is surely someone bent on mischief, I must follow him. When Heimdall reached the palace, he found it was Loki, changed into another form, creeping softly about. Heimdall quietly watched him, saw him glide into Freya's besides, where the fair goddess lay asleep, wearing a beautiful necklace. Loki had come to steal the necklace, but when he saw that she was lying on the clasp of the chain, so that he could not undo it without waking her, he changed himself into a knut, and, crawling along the pillow, stung her just enough to make her turn over, but not enough to wake her. Then, he unclasped the chain and ran off with it as fast as he could. But Heimdall was not going to let the thief get away. As soon as Loki found that he was followed, he took his other form, a little flame of fire. Heimdall then took his other shape and became a shower of rain to put out the fire. But Loki, quick and watchful, changed himself into a bear to catch the rain. Then Heimdall too became a bear and a fierce fight begun. At last, the rain god conquered and forced wicked Loki to give back the necklace to Freya. The whole land seemed to feel sorry for poor lonely Freya. The leaves fell from the trees, the bright flowers faded, and the singing birds flew away. Once more, the fair goddess went to fall from her skirt to see Odor. Away, away to the far sunny south she wandered. And there, where the myrtle trees and oranges grow, at last she found her long lost husband. Then, hand in hand, the two turned northward again to their home. And so happy were they together that they spread joy and happiness around them as they passed along. Everywhere the ice and snow told before them. Green grass and sweet flowers sprang up behind their footsteps. The birds sang their sweetest songs. The warm summer came back to the Northlands. And everyone was glad and joyful. Her lovely smiling Freya was at home again. White were the moorlands and frozen before her. Green were the moorlands and blooming behind her. Out of her gold locks, shaking her spring flowers. Out of her garments, shaking her south winds. Around in the birches, awaking the throstles. Beautiful Freya came. The Emma of Thor Zif was the wife of mighty Thor, the thunder gods, and she was very proud of her beautiful golden hair. When she combed and braided with great care, one morning, when she awoke, she was filled with grief and dismay to find that her lovely hair had been cut off in the night while she slept. Her husband happened to be away that day, but when he came home late at night, Sif was careful to keep out of his sight. She felt so ashamed of her shorn head. Thor, however, soon called for Sif, and when he saw what had been done to her, he was angry. 
very angry. No, Thor had a quick temper. Everyone feared his fierce anger. Who could have done this wicked deed? Thought he. There's only one among all the Aesir who would think of doing such a thing. Thor lost no time in finding Loki, and that mischief god had to admit that he was the guilty one. But he begged Thor to give him just a few days, and he promised to get something for Sif that would make her look more beautiful than ever. So Thor decided to give him a chance to try, and commanded him to give back to Sif her golden hair. Now Loki knew a place where some wonderful workmen lived, so he went off as fast as he could go to Niflheim. The home of the dwarves under the earth, and ask one of them to make quickly some golden hair for Sif. Besides this, he asked for two gifts to carry to the gods Odin and Frey, so that they might be on his side if Thor should bring his complaint before the Aesir. Loki did not have to wait long, for the dwarf brought him a quantity of beautiful hair. Spun from the finest golden threads, it had a wonderful power of growing just like real hair. As soon as it touched anyone's head, besides this, there was a spear of Odin which never missed its aim, no matter how far it was thrown. And for Frey, a ship that could sail through the air as well as the sea. Although it was large enough to hold all the gods and their horses, yet it could be folded so that it was small enough to put in one's pocket. Loki was greatly pleased with these wonderful presents, and declared that this dwarf must be the most skillful workman of them all. Now, it happened that another dwarf named Brok heard him say this. And he told Loki that he was sure he and his brother could make wonderful things, more wonderful things than these. Loki did not believe that it could be done, but he told Brok to try his skill. The Aesir should judge between them, and the one who should fail in the trial must lose his head. Then, Brok called his brother Sindri. And they set to work at once. They first built a great fire, and Sindri threw into it a lump of gold. Then he told Brock to blow the bellows while he went out, and be sure not to stop blowing until he should come back. Brock thought this an easy task, but his brother had not long been gone. When a huge fly came in and buzzed about his face, and bore at him so that he could hardly keep on blowing, still he was able to finish his work. So, that when Sindri came back, they took out of the fire an enormous white ball, which gave out light and could travel the air with wonderful speed. On the second day. Sindri threw another lump of gold into the fire, and left his brother to blow the bellows. Again, the buzzing, stinging fly came, and was even more troublesome before. But Brock tried very hard to be patient, and was able to bear it without stopping his work until Sindri returns. Then, they took her from the fire, a magic ring of gold, from which. Eight new rings fell off every week. The third day, a lump of iron was put into the fire, and Brock again left alone. In came the cruel fly. If you guess that it was really the mischief maker Loki, he bit the poor little dwarf so hard on the forehead that the blood ran down into his eyes and blinded him. So that he could no longer see to do his work, poor Brok had to stop just before Sindri came home, but not before the hammer 
which they were making in the fire, nearly finished. Only the handle came out rather too short. This magic hammer was named Mjolnir. It had the power of never missing its mark, and would always return to the hand which threw it. When Loki appeared at last before the Aesir, with the two dwarf brothers and their gifts, it was declared that they had made the finest things. For the hammer, which was given to Thor, would surely be most useful in keeping the giants out of Asgard. When Loki found that the judgment was against him, he started to run away. But Thor soon made him turn back by threatening to throw his hammer after him. Then, Loki had to collect his wits and think of some way to escape losing his head. Instead of making the dwarves pay the forfeit as he expected, at last. He told Brock and Sindri that they could have his head, according to the agreement. But as nothing had been said about his neck, they could not, of course, touch it. Thus, the wily Loki, by his wit, saved his life. Thor's wonderful journey. One morning, Thor asked Loki, the Fire God. If he would like to go for with him to Utgard, the stronghold of giants, where he was going to try, with his mighty hammer, to conquer those fierce enemies of Asgard, Loki was glad to go with him, and the two gods started forth in Thor's chariot, drawn by two goats. Thor often went on a journey, so the dwellers in Asgard did not wonder to see him getting ready for a long drive. As Thor and Loki drove along, the heavy chariot rattled and made the thunder echo among the hills. People in our world down below in Midgard heard the rumbling and said, "What a heavy thunderstorm! How、oh, the thunder crashes and rumbles!" Toward evening, the travelers stopped at a peasant's hut, and Thor, alighting from his chariot. Went to the door of the house to ask shelter for the night. I will gladly give you a room, but I have no food in the house," said the man who opened the door. "Oh, never mind that," said Thor. "I will provide the food." So, Thor and Loki stopped for the night at the peasant's hut. They found the family within: the man, his wife. And two children, a boy and a girl, all looked on in great surprise to see Thor kill his two goats and cook them for the evening meal. Eat all your wish of the meat," said Thor. "But careful not to break any of the bones. Throw them all into the two skins which I have spread upon the floor." Now, the boy, whose name was Thialve. Wondered why Thor should say this, and as he happened to have a piece of leg bone, he thought there could be no harm in breaking it open to get out the soft marrow to eat. Thor was just talking to Loki and did not notice what had been done. The next morning, the boy learned a lesson that he never forgets. When Thor was ready to start off again next day. He held his magic hammer over the skins, which lay the bones. All at once, the goats became whole again and stood there, just the same as before, except that one of them limped with his hind leg. Then the young Calvin knew why Thor had told him not to break the bones. At first, when he saw Thor's angry face, now he grasped his hammer. The boy was frightened. He wanted to run away, but soon he remembered it would be cowardly to do that. So he went to Thor and asked for forgiveness. Now the mighty Thunder God, though often angry, was always just as kind. After scolding the boy as he deserved, he freely forgave him and said that he and his sister might go along with Loki, 
and himself on their journey. The four started off after saying goodbye to the peasant and his wife, leaving in their charge chariot and goats, where it seemed best to finish the journey on foot. At nightfall, they entered a thick forest, through which they wandered on for miles. When all at once they came upon a house, and a strange-looking house it was. The wide front door opened into a big room. At the left was a small room, and just opposite the front door were four long, narrow rooms. The travelers wandered to find a house in the depths of a forest. But they were glad to have shelter for the night, and all lay down for a good rest. Soon after midnight, they were awakened by groans and strange sounds, and the earth began to tremble. Tom sent his companions into the farthest room, grasped his hammer, and stood on guard by the door. At daybreak, he started forth to find out what had caused the noise. He had not gone far when he came upon a huge giant, lying on the ground asleep, and Thor found that he was making the earth tremble with his snoring, which must have been the sound they had heard in the night. While Thor was looking at the giant, he awoke and spoke to the god. "Ho <laughs> ho! I think you little fellow must be Thor, of whom I have often heard, but really." I did not think you were quite so small. Now the sun is up and I must be off. But where is my other cloth? Ah, here it is on the ground. And the giant stooped and picked up his cloth. It was the very house in which our four travelers had spent the night, with the big front door, where the hand went in, the thumb for the one side room. And the four narrow finger rooms opposite the door. If you are going my way, you may come along with me," said the giant. So they journeyed together for one day, but even mighty Thor could hardly keep up with the giant's long strides. When the night came, the giant stopped under a large oak tree and said, "I'm going to sleep." You made your supper, if you wish. Here is a bag full of things. Saying this, he fell asleep and was soon snoring. But when Thor tried to open the bag of food, he could not untie the cord. This made him angry. But the giant had tied up their food with his own. He looked at the huge figure lying before him asleep. When he thought. What a mean trick the giant had played upon them! Thor seized the magic hammer and threw it at him. Did a leaf fall on me? Said the giant sleepily. Haven't you eaten your supper yet? Well, I'm going to sleep again. And soon he was snoring louder than before. Thor grasped his hammer tighter than ever, and threw it with such strength. And it seemed as though it must surely have killed the giants, but again he rubbed his eyes and said, "I thought an acorn fell on my head." He had hardly spoken when he was asleep again. Then, a third time, Thor hurled his hammer with all his strength, and it seemed to hit his enemy in the forehead, and was buried outside. But the giant only said, "I think there must be birds overhead in this tree. I thought a feather dropped down on me. Are you awake, Thor? I think we'd better be going on with our journey. And if you are bound to go to Utgard, I will show you the way. But I advise you to go home instead. You will find bigger fellows than I in Utgard." But Thor. Had made up his mind to go on, and nothing could make him change. At noon time, the four friends left their giant guides, whose path led another way. They had not travelled far 
when forced by the large city looming up before them. And soon, they came to Utgard, the home of the fierce giants. Although it was surrounded by higher walls, Thorn and his friends were able to creep through the bars of the great gates. When they came to the palace and found it to open, they went in, and there sat all the giants with their king, Utgar Loki, at their head. A quite different Loki was this giant king from the mischievous fire god, the Loki from Asgard, who now stood before him. Upon seeing the four strangers, the king of the giants said, Why, this must be the good four, I really did not suppose that you were such a little fellow, Thor, but probably you are stronger than you look. Now, before you sit down at our table, you must each show some proof of your strength. Then, Loki, who was very hungry, said, he was sure he could eat more than anyone else. So, the king called one of the giants to come forth, saying to Loki, if you can indeed eat more than one of my men, you will perform a great feat. A huge trough full of meat was brought in, and Loki began eating at one end, while a giant began at the other end. They reached the center together, but Loki had only eaten the meat, while a giant had devoured meat, bones, through and all. The alpha, the peasant boy, took his turn next, and boasted that he was the fastest runner of all of them. Oh, said the king, it will be a most wonderful feat if you can win a race against one of my men. The first time, the alpha ran the course he kept ahead until near the end, and was beaten by only a few yards. The second time he came off first, and the third time, he was only halfway around when the giant had reached the goal. Thor, however, was not at all cast down by the failure of the others, and he proposed to try a drinking match. So, the king brought forth a long drinking horn, saying, My men usually empty this in one draught, if they are very thirsty, though sometimes they have to take it in two swallows, or even three. And then, Thor put his lips to the drinking horn and took one long deep pull, thinking he had surely emptied it. But to his surprise, the water had lowered only a few inches. Again, he lifted the thorn, feeling sure he should empty it this time. Yet, he did not better than before. The king said, you have left a great deal for your last drink. This made Thor try his very best. But it was of no use. He could not empty the horn. So, you are not as strong as you seem after all. Do you care to try anything else? Said the king of the giants in a mocking tone. Oh, certainly anything you like, replied Thor. Well, said the king. I will give you something easy this time, since I see you are not as strong as I expected. You may try to lift this cat from the floor. It would be a child's play of one of my men. Thor put out his hand to lift the cat, but he would rise only one paw, though he used all his strength. Well, it is no more than I expected said the king. You boast of your strength, but you do not show it to us. By this time, Thor was getting very angry, and he spoke fiercely. I will challenge any of you to fight me. The king looked about the hall to find someone small enough to wrestle Thor. Then he said, All oh, my men are too large. I shall have to send for one of the women. Soon, a bent old woman came hobbling in, 
and Thor thought it would be nothing to overcome her. But the longer they wrestled, the stronger the woman became. And at last, when it was plain that she was going to win, and Thor had been thrown down upon the floor, the king called them to stop. Thor and his friends were then invited to sit down at the feast, and the next morning, after a good breakfast, they started on their journey homeward. Utgard Loki, the giant king, went with them to the city gate, and when he was about to leave them, he said, Do you find it as easy as you expected to overthrow the giants? No, said Thor, who was too honest to hide his shame. I am vexed that I have done so little. I do know that after this failure, you will all laugh at my weakness. No, indeed, replied the king. Since you are now well outside our stronghold, I will tell you the truth about what you saw there, and I will take good care not to let you get in again. You have greatly surprised us all. Have you did not dream that you were so strong, and I have had to use magic to hold out against you. When you met the first giant in the forest, you would have killed him with your hammer if he had not put a mountain between himself and you. Loki was a wonderful eater, but we matched him against fire, and who can devour more than fire? The boy was a swift runner, and I had to make him race against thoughts in order to beat him. What can be swifter than thoughts? The horn from which you drank was the ocean, and you took such a mighty throat that the people in Midgard saw the tide ebb. It was really not a cat you tried to lift, but the Midgard serpent, and you pulled him so far that we feared he would let him go his hold. Then you wrestled with old age, and who is there that can overcome old age? With these words, the giant vanished, and Thor, upon looking around, saw the city of Ulgard was also gone. Then, silently, but with many thoughts of these strange things, Thor and Loki, with the boy and the girl, made their way back to Asgard. Oh, Thor lost his hammer. Come, Loki, are you ready? My goats are eager to be off, cried Thor, as he sprang into his chariot, and away they went, thundering over the hills. All day long they journeyed, and at night they lay down to rest by the side of a brook. When Baldo, the bright sun god, awoke them in the morning, the first thing Thor did was to reach out for Mjolnir, his magic hammer, which he had carefully laid by his side the night before. Why, Loki, cried he, alas, my hammer is gone. Those evil frost giants must have stolen it from me while I slept. How shall we hold Asgard against them without my hammer? They will surely take our stronghold. We must go quickly and find it then, replied Loki. Let us ask Freya to lend us her falcon garment. Now, the goddess Freya had a wonderful garment made of falcon feathers, and whoever wore it looked just like a bird. So you might suppose this was sometimes a very useful thing. So, Thor and Loki went quickly back to Asgard, and drove with all speed to Freya's palace, where they found her sitting among their maidens. Asgard is in great danger, said Thor, and we have come to you, fair goddess, to ask if you will lend us your falcon garment, for my hammer has been carried off, and we must go in search of it. Surely, answered Freya, I would lend you my falcon cloak, even if it were made of gold and silver. And then, Loki quickly dressed himself in Freya's garments and flew away to the land of the frost giants, where he found their king making colors of gold for his dogs and combing his horses. As Loki came near, 
He looked up and said, Ah, Loki, how fair the mighty gods in Asgard? They I see you in great trouble, replied Loki, and I'm sent to fetch the hammer Thor. And do you think I'm going to be foolish enough to give it back to you? After I have had all the trouble of getting it into my power, said the king, I've buried it deep, deep down in the earth, and there's only one way by which you can get it again. You must bring me the goddess Freya to be my wife. Loki did not know what to say to this, for he felt sure that Freya would never be willing to go away from Asgard to live among the fierce giants. But as he saw no chance of getting a hammer, he flew back to Asgard to see what could be done. Thor was anxiously looking out for him. What news do you bring me, Loki? cried he. Have you brought to me my hammer back? Alas, no, said Loki. I bring only a message from a giant king. You will not give up your hammer until you persuade Freya to marry him. Then Thor and Loki went together to Freya's palace, and the fair goddess greeted them kindly. But when she heard that they ran and found they wished her to marry the cruel giant, she was very angry and said to Thor, You should not have been so careless as to lose your hammer. It is all your fault that it is gone, and I will never marry the giant to help you get it again. Thor then went to tell Father Odin, who called a meeting of all the idea. But it was a very serious matter they were to consider. If the king of the giants only knew the power of the mighty hammer, he might storm Asgard and carry off the fair Freya to be his bride. So, the Aesir met together in a grey judgment hall in the palace of Gladsheim. Long and anxiously, they talked over the peril, trying to find some plan for saving Asgard from these enemies. At last, Heimdall, the faithful watchman of the Rainbow Bridge proposed a plan. Let us dress Thor, said he, in Freya's robes, braid his hair, and him wear Freya's wonderful necklace, and a brittle whale. No, indeed, cried Thor angrily. You would all laugh at me in a woman's dress. I will do no such thing. We must find some other way. But... When no other way could be found, Elas Thor was persuaded to try Heimdall's plan, and the Aesir went to work to dress the mighty thunder god like a bride. He was the tallest of them all, and of course, he looked very queer to them in his woman's clothes. But he would be small enough beside a giant. Then they dressed Loki to look like the bride's waiting maids, and the two set off to Utgard, the stronghold of the giants. When the giant king saw them coming, he bade his servants make ready the wedding feast, and invited all his giant subjects to come and celebrate his marriage with the lovely goddess Freya. So the wedding party sat down to the feast, and for who was always a good eater, ate one ox and ate salmon, and drank three casks of meat. The king watched him, greatly surprised to see a woman eat so much, and said, Where hast thou seen such a hungry pride? But the watchful Loki, who stood nearby as the bride's waiting maid, whispered in the king's ear, Eight nights has Freya fasted, he would take no food, so anxious was she to be your bride. This pleased the giant, and he went over the floor, saying he must kiss his fair bride. But when he lifted the bride away, such a gleam of light shot from Thor's eyes, that the king started back and asked why Freya's eyes were so sharp. Again, Loki replied, For eight nights the fair Freya has not slept. So greatly did she long to reach here. This again pleased the king, and he said, Now, let the hammer be brought and given to the brides. 
for the hour has come for our marriage. All this time, Thor was so eager to get his treasure back that he could hardly keep still. And if it had not been for what the Willy Loki said, he might have been found out too soon. But at last, the precious hammer was brought and handed to the bride. This was always the custom at weddings. As soon as Thor grasped it in his hand, he threw it off his woman's robes and stood out before the astonished giants. And then did the mighty thunderer sweep down his foes, and many of the cruel frost giants were slain. Once more, the sacred city of Asgard was safe from danger, or Thor was its defender, and he was careful never again to let his magic hammer be taken from him. Besides the hammer, Thor had two other precious things, his spell of strength, which doubled his power when he tightened it, and his iron cloth, which he put on when he was going to throw the hammer. I am the god Thor, I am the war god, I am the thunderer, here in my north land, my fastness and fortress, reign I forever, here amid icebergs. Rule I the nations. This is my hammer Mjolnir the mighty. Giant and sorcerers cannot withstand it. These are the gauntlets wherewith I wield it and hurl it afar off. This is my griddle. Whenever I praise it, strength is redoubled. A gift from Frigga. Long years ago, there lived a peasant and his wife. Or let a quiet, busy life on their little farm at the foot of a mountain. While the wife was busy indoors with her housework, her husband watched his flocks in the fields or sometimes wandered up the mountainside to hunt for game, which he would carry home for dinner. One day, he had strayed further than usual and found himself on the top of the mountain, where the ground was covered with ice and snow. All at once he came upon a high arched doorway opening into a grey glacier, and he passed through the sea whither it might let. The passageway widened out into a wonderful cavern, like a broad hall sparkling with precious stones and long shining stalactites that looked like icicles of marble. In the midst stood a beautiful goddess surrounded by fair maidens, all dressed in silvery robes and crowned with flowers. The shepherd was so overcome by the wonder of the sight that he sang upon his knees. Then. The goddess stretched forth her hands and gave him her blessing, telling him to choose whatever he wishes to carry home from the cavern. The man was no longer afraid when he heard her kind voice speaking to him, so he looked about and at last humbly asked to have the pretty blue flowers which the fair one held in her hands. The lovely goddess Frigga or Holder, as the German people call her, smiled kindly and told the poor shepherd he had made a wise choice. She gave him her bunch of blue flowers with a measure of seed, saying to him, You will live and be prosperous so long as the flowers do not fade. The peasant bowed thankfully before the goddess, and when he rose, she had vanished and he was all alone on the mountainside, just as usual, with no cavern, no sparkling stones, and no maidens to be seen. If it had not been for the pretty blue flowers and the measure of seed in his hand, he would have thought it was all a dream. He hurried homeland to tell his wife, he was angry when she heard the story, but she thought he had made such a foolish choice. How much better it would have been, she said, if you had brought home some of those precious stones you tell about, which are worth money. 
instead of these good-for-nothing flowers. The poor man bore her angry words quietly and made the best of what he had. He went to work at once to sow his seeds, which he found, to his surprise, were enough to plant several fields. Every morning, before he led his flock to pasture, and on his way home at night, he watched the little green shoots growing in his fields. Even his wife was pleased when she saw the lovely blue blossoms of the flax opening. Then, after they had withered and fallen, the seeds formed. Sometimes it seemed to the good man as he stood in the twilight looking over his fields, that he saw a misty form, like a beautiful goddess, stretching out her hands over the field of flax, to give it her blessing. When at length the seeds had ripened, Frigga came again, to show the peasant how to gather his harvest of flax, and to teach his wife to spin and weave it into fine line which she bleached in the sun. The people came from far and near to buy the line, and the peasant and his wife found themselves busy and happy with money enough and to spare. When they had lived many years and were growing old among the children and grandchildren, the peasant noticed one day that a bunch of flowers given to him so many years before and which he had always kept bright, were beginning to fade. Then he knew he had not much longer to stay. He climbed slowly up the mountainside and found the door of the cavern open. A second time he went in, and a kind goddess figure took the peasant by the hand and led him away to stay with her, where she always took care of him. Frigga was the queen of the gods, and she helped her husband Odin govern the world. It was her part to look after the children, and help the mothers take care of their families. The Stealing of Iduna Odin, the wise father of the gods, started off one day on a journey through Midgard, the world of men, to see how his people were getting on, and to give them help. He took with him his brother Hernia, the light giver, and Loki, the fire gods. Loki, you know, was always ready to go wherever he could have any fun or do any mischief. All the morning, they went about among the homes of Midgard, and whenever Odin found busy, faithful workers, he was sure to leave behind some little thing which would hardly be noticed. A straw in a farmer's barn, or a kernel of grain in a furrow by the plough, or a bit of iron at the blacksmith's forge. But always happiness and plenty followed his little gifts. At noontime, Loki was so hungry that he begged Odin to stop for dinner. So, when they came to a shady spot by the bank of a river, the three gods chose it for their resting place. Odin threw himself down under a tree and began to read his little book of runes or wise sayings. But Loki began to make a fire and get ready for the feast. Then he started off to a farmhouse nearby, leaving her near to cook the meat which they had brought. As Loki came near the farmhouse, he thought to himself, I will change myself into a cat, and then I can have a better chance to spy about. So he changed himself into a black cat and jumping up on the kitchen windowsill, he saw the farmer's wife taking some cakes out of the oven. They smell so good and look so tempting that Loki said to himself, what a prize those cakes would be for our dinner. Just then, the woman turned back to the oven to get more cakes, and Loki snatched those which she had laid on the table. The good housewife soon missed her cakes. 
joked all about and could not think what had become of them. But just as she was taking the last slot from the oven, she turned quickly around and saw the tail of her cat whisking out of the window. There, cried she, and that wicked black cat has stolen my nice cakes. I will go after him with my broom. But by the time she reached the door, all she could see was a cow walking in her garden. And when she had came there to drive her away, nothing was to be seen except a big raven and six little ones flying overhead. And then the mischief slowed Loki went back to the river bank, where he had left his two friends, and showed them the six cakes, boasting of the good joke he had played upon the poor woman. But Odin did not think it was a joke. He scorned Loki for stealing and said, It is a shame for one of the Aesir to be a thief. Go back to the farmhouse and put these three black stones on the kitchen table. Loki knew that the stones meant something good for the poor woman, and he did not wish to go back to the house. What he had to do was the old father told him. As he went along, he heard his friends the foxes, who hooded their hats out of their holes and laughed at his tricks. For the foxes thought Loki was the biggest thief of them all. Changing himself into an owl, Loki flew in at the kitchen window and dropped from his beak the three stones, which, when they fell upon the white table, seemed to be three black stains. The next time the good woman came into her kitchen, she was surprised to find that the dinner was all cooked, and so the wonderful stones that Odin had sent brought good luck. The housewife always found her food ready cooked, and all her jars and boxes filled with good things to eat, and never again was in need. The other women all said, just the best housekeeper in the village. But one thing always troubled her, and that was the table of the three black snails. She scrubbed and scrubbed, but could never make it white again. And now we must go back to Loki. He was very hungry by this time, and he hoped that Hernia would have the meat nicely cooked when he came back to the river bank. But when they took it out of the cattle, they found it was not cooked at all. So Odin went on reading his book of runes, not thinking about food, while Hernia and Orke watched the fire, and at the end of an hour they looked again at the meat. Now. It will surely be done this time, said Loki. But again, they were disappointed, for the meat in the cattle was still raw. Then they began to look about to see what magic might be at work, and at last spied a big eagle sitting on a tree near the fire. All at once the bird spoke and said, If you will promise to give me all the meat, I can eat. It shall be cooked in a few minutes. The three friends agreed to this, and in a short time, as the bird had promised, the meat was well done. Loki was so hungry he could barely wait to get it out of the cattle. But suddenly, the eagle pounced down upon it and seized more than half, which made Loki so angry that he took up a stick to beat the bird. And what do you think happened? Why, the snake, as soon as it touched the bird's back, stuck faster, and Loki found he could not let go of his hand. Then, away flew the eagle, carrying Loki with him, over the fields and over the treetops, until it seemed as though his arms would be torn from his body. He begged for mercy. But the bird flew on and on. At last, Loki said, I will give you anything you ask if you only let me go. Now, the eagle was really the cruel storm giant Yassi, and he said, I will never let you go until you promise to get for me from Asgard the lovely goddess Iduna and her precious apples. 
when Odin and Hernia saw Loki whisked off through the air, they knew that the eagle must be one of their giant enemies. So, they hurried home to Asgard to defend their sacred city, just as they came to be first the Rainbow Bridge. Loki joined them, but he took care not to tell them how the eagle came to let him go. Odin felt sure that Loki had been doing something wrong, but knowing very well that Loki would not tell him the truth, he made up his mind not to ask any questions. The goddess Iduna, whom Loki was to tempt away from out of Asgard, was the dearest of them all. She was the fair goddess of spring and the youth, youth, and all of the Aesir loved her. Her garden was the loveliest spot, with all sorts of bright, sweet flowers, birds singing by day and night, little chattering brooks under the great trees, and everything happy and fresh. The gods loved to go and sit with Hiduna, and rest in her beautiful garden within the walls of Asgard. And there was another delightful thing in the garden, and that was Hiduna's casket. This was a magic box filled with big golden red apples, which she always gave her friends to taste. These wonderful apples were not only delicious to eat, but whoever tasted them, no matter how tired or feeble he might be, would feel young and strong again. So, the dwellers in Asgard ate often of this wonderful fruit, which kept them fresh and young, fit to help the people in the world of Midgard. The girl's good, in which Iduna kept her apples, was always filled, for whenever she took out one, another came in its place. But no one knew where it came from, and only the goddess of youth herself could take the apples from the box. For if anyone else tried, the fruit grew smaller and smaller as the hand came nearer, until at last it vanished away. A few days after Loki's bargain with the giant Yassi, Iduna was in her pride garden one morning, watering the flowers, when her husband, Bragi, came to say goodbye to her, because he must go on a journey. Loki watched him start off, and thought, Now, here is my chance to tempt Iduna away from Asgard. After a while, he went to the garden, and found a lovely goddess sitting among her flowers and birds. She looked up at Loki with such a sweet smile as he came near that he felt almost ashamed of his cruel plan. But he sat down on a grassy bank and asked Iduna for one of her magic apples. After tasting it, he smacked his lips, saying, Do you know, Feiduna? As I was coming home toward Asgard one day, I saw a tree full of apples which were really larger and more beautiful than yours. I do wish you would go with me and see them. Why? How can they be? said Iduna. For Father Odin has often told me that my apples were the largest and finest he ever saw. I should so like to see those others, and I think I will go with you now to compare them with mine. Come on then, said Loki, and you'd better take along your own apples, so that we can try them with the others. Now, Bragi had often told Iduna that he must never wander away from home, but, thinking it would do no harm to go such a little way just as once, she took the casket of apples in her hand and went with Loki. They had hardly passed through the garden gate when she began to wish herself back again. But Loki, taking her by the hand, hurried along to the rainbow bridge. They had no sooner crossed over Beefrost than they do not saw a big eagle flying toward them. Nearer and nearer he came, until at last he swooped down and seized poor Iduna with the sharp talons and flew away with her to his cold, barren home. There she stayed shut up for many long, dreary months, always longing to get back to Asgard to see Praki and her lovely garden. 
giant Yasi, along with planning, that if he could only once get a fair chorus of youth in his power, he would eat her magic apples, and so get strength enough to conquer Yasiya. But now, after all, she would not give him even one of them. And when he put his hand into the casket, the apples grew smaller and smaller, until at last they vanished, so that he could not get even a taste. This cruel storm giant kept Poidona closely shut up in a little rock chamber, hoping that some day he could force her to give him what he wanted. All day long she heard the sea bathing on the rocks below her gloomy cell. But she could not look out, for the only window was a narrow opening in the rock high up above her head. He saw no one but the giant and his serving women, who waited upon her. When these women first came to her, Iduna was surprised to see that they were not ugly or stern looking, and when she looked at their fair, smiling faces, she hoped they would be friendly and pitiful to her and trouble. She begged them to help her, and, with many tears, told him her sad story. But still, they kept on smiling, and they turned their backs. Iduna saw that they were hollow. These were the Aloe Woman, who had no hearts, and so could never be sorry for anyone. When one is in trouble, it's very hard to be with Ella Woman. Every day, the giant came to ask Iduna in his terrible voice if she had made up her mind to give him apples. Iduna was frightened, but she always had courage enough to say no, for she knew it would be false and cowardly to give to a wicked giant these precious gifts were meant for the high gods. Although it was hard to be a prisoner and to see no one but the cold, fair other women who kept on smiling at the tears, she knew it was far better to belong to the bright Isaiah, even prison, than to be a giant or an other woman, no matter how free or smiling they might be. All this while, the dwellers in Asgard were sad and lonely without their dear Iduna. At first they went to her garden as before, but they missed the pride goddess, and soon the garden itself grew cheery. The fresh green leaves turned brown and fell, the flowers faded. No new woods opened, no bird songs were heard, and the saddest thing of all was that no, the gods had no more of the wonderful apples to keep them fresh and strong, while two strangers, named Age and Pain walked about the city of Asgard, and the Aesir felt themselves growing tired and feeble. Every day, they watched for Iduna's return, and last, when day after day had passed, and still she had not come, a meeting of all the gods and goddesses was called, to talk over what they should do, and where they should search for their lost sister. Loki, you may be sure, to cared not to show himself at the meeting, but when it was found out that Iduna at last was seen walking with him, Bragi went after him and brought him in before all the Aesir. Then, Father Odin was set on his high throne, looking very tired and said, Oh Loki, what is it that you have done? You have broken your promise of brotherhood and brought sorrow upon Asgard. Fail not to bring home again our sister, or else come not yourself within our gates. Loki knew well that this command must be obeyed, and besides, even he was beginning to wish for Iduna again. So, borrowing the cloak of falcon feathers which belonged to the goddess Freya, he put it on and set out for Utgard and the castle of the giant Yassi. It was a gloomy cave in a high rock. By the sea, and there he found poor Iduna shut up in prison. By good luck, the giant was away fishing when Loki arrived. He was able to fly in without being seen, 
through the narrow opening in Iduna's rock cell. It would have taken him to be a just falcon birds, but Iduna knew it was really Loki. He was filled with joy to see him. Without stopping to talk, Loki quickly changed her into a nudge, which he held fast in his falcon claws and flew swiftly northward over the sea toward Asgard. He had not gone far when he heard a rushing noise behind him, and he knew it must be the eagle. Fast and faster flew the falcon with his precious nuts, but a fierce eagle flew still fast after them. Meanwhile, for five days, the dwellers in Asgard gathered together on the city walls, gazing southward, to watch for the coming of the birds. While Loki and Iduna chased by Thiassi, the eagle flew over the wide sea, separating Utgard, the land of the giants, from Asgard. Each night, the eagle was near his prey, and the watchers in the city were filled with fear, lest he should overtake their friends. At last, they thought of a plan to help Iduna, gathering a great pile of wood by the city walls. They set fire to it. When Loki reached a place, he flew safely through the thick smoke and flame. For you know, he was the god of fire, and dropped down into the city with his little nut held fast on his falcon claws. But when the heavy eagle came rushing on after them, he could not rise above the heat of the fire, and, smoothed by the smoke, fell down and was burned to death. There was great joy in Asgard and having a dear Iduna back again. Her friends gathered around her. She invited them all into her garden. But the withered trees and flowers began to sprout and blossom. The gay birds came back, singing and building their nests, and the happy little brooks went dancing under the trees. Iduna sat with Fraggy among her friends, and they all feasted upon her golden apples. She was so thankful to be free at home in her garden again. Once more, Aesir became young and strong, and the two dark strangers went away, where happiness and peace had come back to Asgard. Scotty, while Iduna's friends were still crowding about her, all joyful and glad at getting her home again, they spied someone afar off coming toward Asgard. As the figure drew nearer, they saw it was Skadi, the tall daughter of the frost giant Yassi, who chased Iduna. She was dressed all in white fur and carried a shining hunting spear and arrows. Slung over her shoulder were snowshoes and skates. But Skadi had come from her mountain home in the icy north. Very angry about the loss of her father, she had come to ask Isaiah why they had been so cruel to him. Mother Odin spoke kindly to her, saying, We will do honor to your father by putting his eyes in the sky, where they will always shine as two bright stars, and the people amid God will remember the see whenever they look up at night and see the two twinkling lights. Besides this, we will also give you gold and silver. But Skadi, thinking money could never repay her for the loss of her father, was still angry. Loki looked at her stern face, and he said to himself, If we can only make Skadi laugh, she will be more ready to agree to the plan. And he began to think of some way to amuse her, taking a long cord. He tied her to her goat, it was an invisible cord, which no one could see, and Loki himself held the other end of it. Then he began to dance and cap about, and the goat had to do just what Loki did. It really was such a funny sight that all the girls shouted with laughter, but even poor sorrowful Skadi had to smile. When the Aesir saw this, they proposed another plan. Skadi might choose one of the gods for her husband, but she must choose from seeing only his bare feet. The giantess looked at them all as they stood before her. When she saw the bright face of Baldur, more beautiful than all the rest, she agreed to their plan. 
saying to herself, It might be that I should chose him, and then I should surely be happy. The guards then stood in a row behind a curtain, so that Scardy could see nothing but her bare feet. She looked carefully at them all, and at last chose to pair her feet, which seemed to her the whitest and finest shape. Thinking those must be Baldur's, but when the curtain was taken away, she was surprised and sorry to find she had chosen Njord, the god of the seashore. The wedding took place at Asgard, and when the feasting was over, Skadi and Njord went to dwell in his home by the sea. At first they were very happy, for Njord was kind to his giant bride. But how could you expect one of the Aesir to live happily very long with a frost jointers for his wife? Asgardi did not like the roar of the waves and hated the cries of the seagulls and the smurmur of gentle summer winds. She longed for her frozen home, far away in the north amid ice and snow. And so, they finally agreed that for nine months of the year, Nier should live with Skadi among the snowy mountains, that she found happiness and hunting over the wide hills and valleys on her snowshoes, with her hunting dogs at her side, or skating on the ice-bound rivers and lakes. Then, for the three short months of summer, Skadi must live with Nyrd in his palace by the sea, where he calmed the stormy ocean waves and helped the busy fishermen to have good sailing for their boats. Nier laughed to wander along the shore, his jacket trimmed with a fringe of lovely seaweed, and his belt made of the prettiest shells on the beach, with the friendly little sandpipers running before him, and beautiful gulls on the other sea, birds sailing in the air above his head. Sometimes he laughed to sit on the rocks by the shore, watching his heels play in the sunshine or feeding the beautiful swans, his favorite birds. There is a kind of sponge, which the people in Norv still call Nierd's cloth, in memory of his old Norse god, Baldur. Baldur was the best beloved of all the gods. Odin was their father and king. To him they turned for help and wise advice. But... It was to Baldur they went for loving words and bright smiles. The sight of his kind face was a joy to the Aesir, and to all the people of Midgard, and they sometimes called him the God of Light, a good name for him, because he truly gave to the world light and strength. Baldur was the son of Odin and Frigga. He was the most gentle and lovely of all the gods. His beautiful palace in Asgard was bright and spotless. No evil creature could enter there. No one who had wrong thoughts could stay in that palace of love and truth. At last, after the bright summer was over, for many days, Baldur had looked sad and troubled. Some of the Aesir saw it, but most of all, his loving, watchful mother Frigga. Baldur could not bear to worry his mother, so he kept his sorrow to himself, saying nothing about it. But at last Frigga drew his secret from him, and then his friends knew that Baldur had had dreams which told of coming trouble, dreams of his leaving all his friends and going away from Asgard to dwell in another land. Odin and Frigga, fearing their dreams might come true, and they must lose their beloved son, began to think what they could do to prevent it. Then the loving mother said, I will make all things in the world promise not to hurt our son. And so, Queen Frigga, and out for everything in the whole world, and everything came trooping to Asgard to her palace. All living creatures came from the lands, from the water, and from the air, 
all plants and trees came, all rocks, stones, and even the metals under the earth, where the busy dwarves worked. Fire came, and water, as well as all poisons and sickness. Everything promised not to harm the good Baldur, except one little plant called Mistletoe, which was so small that Frigga did not send for it, feeling sure it caught you not to do any harm. Now, I am happy once more, said the queen, for Baldur is safe. Then she sat in peace in her beautiful palace, rejoicing that her dear son was free from all danger. But Odin, the wise old father, still felt uneasy, even after all these promises, fearing what might happen. So he took his eight-footed sled Sleipnir, and rode forth from Asgard to the underworld to find Hela, the wise woman who rolled over that far off land. She could tell everything that was going to happen, and she knew the names of all those who were coming to dwell with her. Odin was the only one wise enough to speak with Hela, but no one else knew the words that would call her forth from her dwelling. But when Odin called, she came to answer. Tell me, said he, for whom are you making ready this costly room? We make ready for Baldur, the god of light, replied Hela. Who, then, will slay Baldur, and bring such darkness and sorrow to Asgard? Again, said the wise woman, it is Hodor, Baldur's twin brother, who will slay the sun gods. And with these words, she vanished. Sadly, Father Odin returned to Asgard, and told his wife the words of Hela, but Frigga was not troubled in her heart, but she felt sure that nothing would hurt her dear son. One beautiful sunny day, at the end of summer, the gods had all gone out into an open field beyond Asgard to have some sports. As they all knew, that nothing could hurt Baldur. They placed him at the end of the field for targets, and then took turns throwing the darts at him, just for the fun of seeing them fall off without hurting him. They thought this was showing great honor to Baldur, and he was pleased to join in the sports. Loki happened to be away when he began to play. When he came, he was angry in his heart that nothing could hurt Baldur. Why should he be so favored? I hate him, said Loki to himself, and began at once to plan some evil. All this while Queen Frigga sat in her palace, thinking of all her dear sons, and of how much good they did to man. As she sat thus, thinking and spinning with her hands, there came a knock at the door. The queen called, Come in and an old woman stood before her. Frigga spoke kindly to her, and soon the old woman said she had passed by the fields when the gods were playing and throwing sharp weapons at Baldur. Oh yes, said Frigga, neither metal nor wood can hurt him. All things in the world have given me their promise. What? said the old woman. Do you mean? that all things have really vowed to spare Baldur. Oh, replied the queen, except one little plant that grows on the eastern side of Asgard. It is called Mistletoe. They thought it too small and soft to do any harm. Before long, the old woman went away, and when she was quite out of sight of Freya's palace, threw off her woman's clothes. And who do you suppose it was? Why, no woman at all. But the wicked Loki, of course, who hurried away out of Asgard to find the poor little plant that did not know about Baldur's danger. But he came to the place where the plant grew. Loki, cutting off a branch, quickly made a sharp arrow, which he carried back to the playgrounds 
and the Aesir were still at their game. All but one. Odor, the god of darkness, Baldur's blind twin brother. And then Loki went up to Odor and said to him in a low voice, Why do you not join with the others in doing honor to Baldur? I cannot see to the game, you know. And besides, I have no weapon, said Hodor. Come then, here's a fine new dart for you, and I will guide your hands, whispered wicked Loki. And then he slipped the arrow of mistletoe boots into Hodor's hand, and aimed it himself at Baldur, who stood there so bright and smiling. Then poor blind Hodor heard a dreadful cry from all the gods. Baldur the Beautiful had fallen, struck by the arrow. He would now be taken away from them, to live with Hela in the underworld. Every heart was filled with sorrow for this dreadful loss, but no one tried to punish him who had done the wicked deed, but he stood upon sacred ground, and the fear was named the peace that, or place of peace, where no one might hurt another. Besides, the gods did not know it was the false Loki who hated Baldur that had struck him down. When Frigga heard the sad news, she asked who would win her love by going to the underworld and begging Hela to let Baldur come back to them. Hermod, the swift messenger god, ready to do his mother's bidding, set forth at once on the long journey. Nine days and nine nights, he travelled without resting, until he came to Hela's underworld. There he found Baldur, who was glad to see him, and sent messages to his friends in Asgard. Hela said Baldur might return to them on one condition, that every living creature and everything in the world must be for him. So, Hermod hasted back to Asgard, and when Aesir heard Hela's answer, they sent out messengers over the world to bid all things weep for Baldur, the bright sun gods. Then did the beasts, the birds, the fishes, the flowers and trees, even stones and metals weep, as indeed we can see the teardrops come to all things when they are changed from heat to cold. As the messengers were coming back to Asgard, they met an old woman, who they bade weep, but she replied, Let Hela keep Baldur down below, why should I care? When Azir heard of this, they thought it must have been the same old woman, who went before Frigga's palace, and we know who that was. And so, Baldur the Beautiful, Baldur the Bright, did not come back, and all the dwellers in Asgard were sad and sorrowful without him. Aegir's Feast Aegir was the ruler of the ocean, and his home was deep down below the tossing waves, where the waters calm and still. There was his beautiful palace in the wonderful coral caves. His walls all hung with bright colored seaweeds and a floor of white sparkling coral sand. Such wonderful sea plants grew all about, and still more wonderful creatures, some which you could not tell from flowers, waving their pretty fringes in the water, some sitting fastened to the rocks and catching their food without moving, like the sponges, others darting about and chasing each other. Deep in the wave is a coral grove, where a purple mullet and gold is rove, where the sea flower spreads its leaves of blue, that never are wet with falling dew, but in bright and changeful beauty shine, Far down in the green and classy prime, the floor is of sand like the mountain drift, 
and the pearl shells spangle the flinty snow. From coral rocks the seaplants lift, their pores where the tides and billows flow. The waters calm and still below, where the winds and waves are absent there, and the sands are bright as the stars that glow in the motionless fields of upper air. In that ocean home, lived the lovely mermaids, who sometimes came up above the waves to sit on the rocks and comb their long golden hair in the sunshine. And they had heads and bodies like beautiful maidens, with fish tails instead of feet. One day, the gods in Asgard gave a feast, and Aegir was invited. He could not often leave home to visit Asgard, for he was always very busy with the ocean winds and tides and storms. While calling his daughters the waves, he bade them keep the ocean quiet while he was away, and look after his ships at sea. Then, Aegir went over Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge, to Asgard. When I had such a gay party and such feasting, that he was sorry when the time come to go home. But at last he said goodbye to Fat Odin and the rest of the Aesir. He thanked them all for the pleasure they had given him, saying, If only I had a cattle that held enough meat for us all to drink, I would invite you to visit me. Thor was always glad to hear about eating and drinking, said, I know of a cattle a mile wide and a mile deep. I will fetch it for you. Then Aegir was pleased and set a day for them all to come to his great feast. So Thor took with him his brother, the brave Tyr, who knew best how to find the cattle, and together they started off in Thor's thunder chariot, drawn by goats on their way to Utgard, the home of giants. When they reached the land of ice and snow, they soon found the house of Humir, the giant who owned Mile Deep, as the big cow was called. The gods were glad to find that the giant was not at home, and his wife, who was more gentle than most of her people, asked them, to come in and rest, advising them to be ready to run when they should hear the giant coming, and to hide behind a row of cattle which hung from a beam at the back end of the hall. For, said she, my husband may be very angry when he finds strangers here, and often the clans of his eye is so fierce that it kills. At first, the mighty Thor and brave Thur were not willing to hide like cowards. But at last, they agreed to the plan, upon the good wife promising to call them out as soon as she had told her husband about them. It was not long before they heard the heavy steps of Himir, as he came striding into his icy home. And very lucky it was for Thor and Thur that the giantess had told them to hide. For when a giant heard the two of the Aesir from Asgard were in his home, so fierce a flesh shot from his eyes that it broke the beam from which the kettle hung, and they all fell broken on the floor, except mile deep. After a while, the giant grew quiet, and at last even began to be polite to his guests. He had been unlucky at his fishing that day, so he had to kill three of his oxen for supper. For being hungry as usual, made him here quite angry by eating two or oxen. So that, when he rose from the table, the giant said, If you keep on eating as much at every meal as you have tonight, Thor, you will have to find your own food. Very well, said Thor. I will go fishing with you in the morning. Next morning, Thor set forth with the giant, 
and as they walked over the fields toward the sea, Thor cut off the head of one of the finest oxen for bait. Of course, you may know that Humiel was not pleased at this, but Thor said he should need the very best kind of maid. We was hoping to catch the mythical serpent, the dangerous monster who lived at the bottom of the ocean, coiled around the world with his tail in his mouth. When they came to the shore where the boat was ready, each one took an oar, and they rowed out the deep water. Emil was tired first, and called to Thor to stop. We are far enough out, he cried. This is my usual fishing place, where I find the best whales. If we go further in the sea, we'll be rougher, and we may run into the mythical serpent. As this was just what Thor wanted, he rode all the harder and did not stop until they were far out on the ocean, and then he baited his hook with the ox's head and threw it overboard. Soon, there came a fierce jerk on the line. It grew heavier and heavier, but Thor, though with all his might, he tugged so hard that he broke through the bottom of the boat and had to stand on the slippery rocks beneath. All this time, the giant was looking on, wondering what was the matter. But when he saw the horrid head of the Midgard serpent rising above the waves, he was so frightened that he cut the line, and Thor was trying so hard to ride the world of that dangerous monster, saw him fall back again under the water, even near the magic hammer which Thor hurled at the creature, was too late to hit him, and so the two fishermen had to turn back and way to the shore, carrying the broken boat and oars with them. The giant was proud to think he had been too quick for Thor, and after they reached the house, he said to the Thundergod, Since you think you are so strong, let us see you break this goblet. If you succeed, I will give you the big cattle. And this was just what Thor wanted. So he tightened his belt of strength and threw the goblet with all his might against the wall. But instead of breaking the goblet, he broke the wall. A second time he tried, but did not better. Then the giant's wife whispered to Thor, throw it at his head. And she sang in a low voice as she turned her spinning wheel. Heart a pillar, heart a stone. Harder yet the giant's bone, stone shall break and fill us fall, whom his forehead breaks them all. Yet again, Thor threw the goblet, this time against the giant's head, and it fell, broken in pieces. Then, to a drive to lift the mile deep cattle, we was in a hurry to leave this land of ice and snow, but he could not steer it from its place, and Thor had to help him before they could get it out of the giant's house. When Himya saw the gods, whom he hated, carrying off his cattle, he called all his giant friends, and they started out in chase of the Aesir. But when Thor heard them coming, he turned and saw their fierce grinning faces glaring down at him from every rocky peak and iceberg. Then the mighty thunder raised Mjolnir, the hammer above his head, and hurled it among the giants, who became stiff and cold. All turned into giant rocks that still stand by the shore. Aegir was very glad to get the mile deep, so he set to work to make the meat in it. They were getting ready for their great feast the time of the flax harvest, when all the Aesir were coming from Asker to visit him. Before the day came, all light and joy had gone from the sacred city, because the bright Baldur had been slain, and the homes of the gods were dark and lonely without him. So, they were all glad to visit Aegir to find cheer for their sadness. 
there was Father Odin, with his golden helmet, and Queen Frigga, wearing her crown of stars, golden haired sea, Freya, with facing Garmin, the wonderful necklace, and all the noble company of the Aesir. Oh, except mighty Thor, who had gone far away to the giant lands. As they all sat in Aegir's beautiful ocean hall, drinking the sweet mead and talking together, Loki came in and stood before them, but finding he was not welcome and now seen safe for him, he began saying ugly things to make him more angry, and at last he grew angry himself and slew Aegir's servant, because they praised him. The Aesur drove him out from the hall, but once more he came in and said such dreadful things. At last, Trigger said, Oh, if my son bald away only here, you would silence thy wicked tongue. Then Loki turned to Frigga and told her that he himself was the very one who had slain Baldur. He had no sooner spoken than a heavy peal of thunder shook the door. An angry force strode in, waving his magic hammer. Seeing this, the coward Loki turned and fled. And Asgard was rid of him forever. The punishment of Loki. When Loki was driven out by the mighty Thor from Aegeal's palace hall, he knew that he could never again be allowed to come among the gods in Asgard. Many times had this mischievous fire god brought trouble and sorrow to the Aesir, but now he had done the most cruel deed of all. He had slain Baldur the Good and had driven all light and joy from Asgard. Far away he fled among the mountains, hoping that no one would find him there. And near a lovely mountain stream, he built for himself a hut with four doors, looking north, east, south and west, so that if the wise old father on his high air throne in Asgard should see him, and send messengers to punish him. The watchful Loki could see them coming, and escape him by the opposite door. He spent most of the days and nights thinking how he could get away from the Aesir. If I ran to the stream and turned myself into a fish, he thought, I wonder if they could catch me. I could keep out of the way of a hook. But then there are nets. I guess wife has a wonderful thing like a net for catching fish, and that would be far worse than a hook. When Loki thought of the net, he began to wonder how it was made, and the more he thought, the more he wished he could make one, so as to see how a fish could keep from getting caught in it. He sat down by the fire in his little hut, took a piece of coal and began to make a fish net. He had nearly finished it when, looking through the open door, he saw three of the Aesir in the distance coming toward his hut. Loki well knew that they were coming to catch him, and quickly, throwing his net into the fire, he ran to the stream, changed himself into a beautiful spot of salmon, and leaped into the water. A moment later, the three guards entered the hut, and one of them spied a fishnet burning in the fire. See, cried he, Loki must have been making this net to catch fish. He always was a good fisherman, and now this is just what we want for catching him. So, they snatched the last bit of the net from the fire, and by looking at it, found out how to make another which they took with them to the bank of the stream. The first time the net was put into the water, Loki hit between two rocks, and the net was so light that it floated past him. But the next time, it had a heavy stone weight which made it sink down, The Loki saw he could not get away unless he could leap over the net. He did this, but Thor seeing him, waded out into the stream, where he threw the net again, 
so the Loki must jump a second time, or else go on out into the deep sea. As he leaped, Thor stopped and caught him in his hand. But the fish was so slippery that Thor could hardly hold it. In a struggle, the salmon's tail was pinched so tightly by the thunder god's strong fingers that it was drawn out to a point. And the old stories say that is why salmon tails are so pointed ever since. Thus was Loki called to his own trip, and dreadful was his punishment. Yosia chained him to a high rock and placed a great poisonous serpent hanging over the cliff above his head. If it had not been for Loki's good, faithful wife, he would have died of the poison that dropped from the snake's mouth. She watched by her husband, holding her cup above him to catch the poison. Only when she had to turn aside to empty the cup did the drops fall upon Loki. Then they gave him such terrible pain as he shook the earth with his struggles, and the people in Midgard fled from the dreadful earthquake. In Iceland, the grey Garcia springs of hot water burst through the earth, and the Southland's burning ashes and lava poured down the mountainsides. And there, chained to the cliff, the cruel, mischievous Loki was to lie until the twilight of the gods, the dark day of Ragnarok when all the mighty evil monsters and beasts will get free, and a terrible battle will be fought between them and the gods of Asgard, the twilight of the gods. Loki and Fenrir, the wolf, were safely bound, each to his separate cliff. But still, happiness and peace did not return to Asgard, for Baldur was no longer there, and light and joy had gone from the home of the gods. The Aesir felt that the twilight of the gods, which Odin knew was to come, must be near. Soon began a long, cold winter. Surely it must be the beginning of the Fimble winter, which was to come before the last great battle. From the north came cold blasts and freezing winds. Snow and ice covered the earth. Man could not see the face of the sun or the moon. Everywhere there was darkness. The people grew fierce and unhappy and wicked, but they seemed no longer to love each other. So, the evil deeds of man kept on, and the fierce frost giants grew stronger and stronger. They killed the trees and flowers, and bound the lakes and rivers with icy vents. Even when summertime came, the cold still held on, and no one could see the green grass or the beautiful golden sunlight. The forest giants were pleased to see the trouble they had brought upon men, and hoped they soon could destroy Asgard and the gods. Three long winters passed, with no light to warm and brighten the world. After that, Still three other dreary winters, and then the eagle who sat on the top of the great world tree, Uktarasir, gave a loud, shrill cry, and that the earth shook, the rocks crumbled and fell, so the oak and the wolf were freed from their chains. The waters of the deep ocean rose and rolled high over the lands. And up above the waves, breathing out of the deep, came the monster, Midgard's serpent, to join in the last battle. Now the enemies of the gods were gathering from all sides. The frost giants, the mountain giants with Loki, Fenrir and the Midgard serpent. Heimdall, the faithful watchman, looked from his watchtower by the rainbow bridge. When he saw the host of monsters appearing and raging toward Asgard, he blew his magic horn, Gjallar, which was the signal of warning to the gods. When Father Odin heard the blast of Heimdall's horn, he hastened to arm himself for the battle. Once again, it is said, 
Young father sought wisdom at Mimir's fountain, asking to know how best to lead the Aesir against the enemies. But Mimir said to him, "No one ever knew." For the second call sounded from the Yalar Orm, and the gods, with only at their heads, rode forth from Asgard to meet their foes. Thor took his place beside Odin. But they were soon parted in the struggle. The thunder god fell upon his old enemy, a serpent, whom twice before he had tried to slay. And after a fierce fight, he at last conquered and slew the monster. But the poison spread from the serpent's mouth, overcame the mighty Thor, and he also fell. Heimdall and Loki came face to face, and each slew the other. Thus. Every one of the gods battled each with his foe, till at last the darkness grew deeper, and all, both gods and giants, lay dead. Then fire burst forth, raging from Utgard to Asgard, and all the worlds were destroyed in a dreadful day of Ragnarok. But this was not the end of all. After many months and years, and even centuries had passed, a new world began to appear, with the fair ocean, and a beautiful land with a bright shining sun by day, and a moon, and stars by night. Then once more the light and heat from the sun made the grass and trees grow, and the flowers bloom. Baldur and Hodur came to this beautiful new world. And walked and talked together. Four's sons were there too, and with them, the Hammer Mjolnir, no longer for use against giants, but for helping men build homes. Two people, a man and a woman, who were kept safe through the raging fire, now came to dwell on the earth, and all the children and grandchildren lived at peace. With each other, in this beautiful new world, Baldur and Hodur talked often of the old days when the Aesir dwelled in Asgard, before Loki, the wicked one, brought darkness and trouble to them. With loving words, they spoke of Odin and Frigga, and the brave Thor, who gave his right hand to save the Aesir, of mighty Thor and his faithful Heimdall. Of lovely Freya with a beautiful necklace, and of fair Iduna's garden, where they used to sit and eat her magic apples. But still, they said, we know now that this new world is fairer than the old, and here, also the loving old father watches over his children.